Good evening, happy hump day, and boy, was it a little bit of a hump <laughs> to get to this point right now. I hope that you all have had a great day and uh, you are ready to go through these last two days before we get to the weekend, whatever that means during this time, because I know I haven't been doing a lot of things differently on the weekend than I do during the week because I am still sheltering at home. To all of my viewers who will be catching the broadcast, on the replay. Thank you so much for checking it out and supporting The Angela Ray Show. For those of you who are wondering, what time is it? We had a few technical delays, so that is the reason that we are getting started a little bit late today. We're going to get started with our Ray of Motivation moment. I do want to give you all an opportunity to get on the broadcast because I have a very special guest tonight with a wealth of information, and I want you to be able to hear every single thing that she has to say live if you are trying to get on the broadcast to interact with Christina live. Uh, when you get on the broadcast, go ahead and chime in the comments. Let me know where you are watching from tonight and be sure to share this broadcast with a friend. Again, we'll be getting started with our Ray of Motivation moment in just a second. Thank you, Edwin. I just pulled something out that was a little bit different tonight. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with our Ray of Motivation moment. And for our Ray of Motivation moment tonight, I wanna to ask you the question, what are you doing in the meantime? What are you doing in the meantime? There have been mean times in my life for as long as I can remember. And I haven't always identified them as that. I remember some years ago, I was on my way home from a speaking engagement about 45 minutes from my house. And I was getting off an exit to get some Bojangles Christina might say, I don't need to eat Bojangles anymore. We'll talk about that later. But I was on my way to get some Bojangles. And just as I got off the exit, I noticed that my car started to shake and I had a flat tire. And so my immediate response was to get upset and to, to be frustrated. Like, why do I have a flat tire? I'm still 45 minutes away from home. And then I had that meantime gut check. And I remembered, I have AAA. I have a spare tire in my trunk. I'm less than a mile from Bojangles. I can go park, call AAA, and all will be fine. And literally, that meantime, just a small, small shift in my attitude made all the difference. I'm going to tell you why. When I got to Bojangles, I parked the car, and I called AAA. And when I called, they said, it's going to be about an hour before someone can get to you. And I, I had to fight that meantime moment again because I was about to get a little frustrated, but I was just like, you know what? It, it was summertime. I was like, you're, you're going to be inside Bojangles. You're going to be eating. You have AC. It's going to be okay. So I went inside. I, I did get a salad that day. I actually remember that. I got a salad. But what was interesting to me about shifting my energy and shifting that meantime thought was instead of the hour that I was told it was going to take, I don't know what happened, but there was a triple A person at my car in less than five minutes, he put my spare on my car and then told me that the spare was a little slack. He was gonna take my car over to the nearest gas station to put air in that, brought my car back, and that was before I could finish my salad. So all of a sudden, there was just this shift in the atmosphere for me because I decided to look at the meantime moment very differently. Right now, with everything that is going on in the world from uh, racial unrest to this coronavirus to people having economic challenges, there are a lot of meantime moments for so many people. So I challenge you to take this moment to shift your thinking in the meantime. And that is your Ray of Motivation moment for this hump day edition of the Angela Ray Show. Well, my guest tonight is a PBS 
television host. She has written over eight cookbooks and she has a, a, a heart and at her core is all about healthy eating, whole foods and nutrition. So please help me welcome Christina Pirello. Christina, thank you for being on the Angela Ray Show tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So, uh, you know, this has been a time of, of, it's been different for a lot of people, particularly staying at home. So what has that been like for you? What have you been doing during this time of social distancing and quarantining? Well, my, I have my office in my house for many, many years now. So for me, it, not that much has changed. What's really changed for me is we're five day a week gym people. And I have oh. a massive number, yeah. And I have a massive number of events outside the house, cooking classes, appearances, whatever. And that's been the biggest shift is that everything around that has shut down. So fortunately we had half of the TV show season film. So that's on the air. And so, you know, I'm working out, you know, I, all I have in my, we sold all our gym equipment. So all I have is this one six pound weight. So, <laughs> so I do a hundred bicep curls on this arm and a hundred bicep curls on this arm to stay strong. But just this week, my gym started doing outdoor classes in the parking lot until the gym opens next week. So they're hot and sweaty, but you know, it's that, that's been the biggest and talk about champagne problems, really. That's right. been the biggest change for us, right? And the other thing is, you know, a good majority of my business is travel. We take tiny little groups of about 16 people to Italy. And oh. at this, literally at this moment, I would be on the Amalfi Coast if life was normal, working. And what we do is we provide a healthy vacation for people. So we, uh, I have two assistants, my husband, and we, we provide two meals a day. We stay in the same villa for the whole week that you're there. You're not always packing your suitcase and running to a bus. We see everything, but our, our vacations are very chill. So uh, we've canceled all our trip, put them off till next year, all our trips this year. And so that's been a, that's a huge adjustment for us because this is the first summer that I have been in Philadelphia in years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah. Well, how did you get your start as a chef? Uh, I got my start as a chef when I was 16 years old. My father was a butcher and um, he was a butcher for a big hotel in Miami. And I told him I wanted to work in the kitchen. And he said, well, women don't work in the kitchen. This was in the early 70s. Women okay. don't work in the kitchen. And I'm like, women don't work in the kitchen. He's like, no, but I can get you a job as a waitress. And I was like, I don't want to be a waitress. But I, I decided it was a foot in the door. I take the job. Two days later, I spilled coffee down a patron. And Ooh. that was okay because I apologized. But then I started to laugh. But anyways, it was bad. So the manager of the coffee shop said, you, kitchen. And I was like, great. So I take off for the kitchen. And the chef um, decided that I was going to be a problem. So what he did for the first three months I worked there was all I could do was wash veggies. The next three months, I diced onions. The next three months I shredded cabbage for coleslaw. Then he remembered I was a vegetarian. And for the next three months, I cleaned the insides out of roasting chickens, no gloves. At the end of that three months, he said to me, you really want this job. Don't ever leave my side. And he taught me everything from the, you know, how to make a sauce to pastry, which is where I ended up eventually is, you know, studying pastry and working in pastry. Now, you are a, a natural foods, a whole foods advocate. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. I've read about your story. Share yeah. with my viewers how that has impacted your life. Well, when I, was, when I was 14, I became a vegetarian, but I was an Oreo cookie and Diet Dr. Pepper vegetarian because they're both vegan, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> it didn't, you know, it was, oops. But when I turned 26, um, my mother had just passed away at 49 from colon cancer. And then um, I was diagnosed six months later with what would be stage four of leukemia. It was terminal. And I remember thinking, you know, looking up toward heaven and going, really? Like, really? It's wow. And so I went to the doctors in Philadelphia and they said I had six to nine months to live and that they could try a few things, but I'd probably lose my hair and be sick. And I thought, mm, no, I'm not going to do it. Uh, my plan was to move back to Italy where I had lived and, you know, die dramatically like, you know, in a garret somewhere. Right. And then I met my husband, the man who would be my husband. And he said to me, you don't have to die because you have this, you could, you could change this with food. And I thought, what? 
So he told me about something called macrobiotics. And I thought, well, food, I know. I mean, I can cook. I know food. And uh, so I got rid of all the junk food that I ate, which was a lot. I mean, if there had been a food pyramid when I was starting out, the bottom would have been chocolate and then sugar on top of that and coffee as the very top of the pyramid and a couple of salads thrown in. I was a, truly a junk food vegetarian. And so I, became, I went overnight, literally, and I'm, I don't mean like sort of overnight, literally overnight, emptied the cabinets, gave it to a homeless shelter and loaded my cabinets with brown rice, quinoa, barley, millet, beans, uh, tofu, seaweed, miso. And I remember thinking, oh my Lord, death would be better because I gave up everything I loved, which was sugar. And um, quitting sugar, although I've never been on heroin, but I imagine quitting <laughs> sugar, <laughs> it's like giving up heroin. The withdrawal was, oh man, I, it took about a month to like get off sugar, not eating it. And I swear to, I swear every person that I saw eating something sweet, I wanted to smack because I, I was in such physical withdrawal from sugar. But then at the end of about a month, I thought, man, have you been addicted or what? So I started cooking in earnest, you know, brown rice, whole grains, vegetables, beans. And in two months, I went back to the doctor for a blood test. And he said, I don't know what you're doing, but you're in remission. And I said, isn't that good? And he said, yeah, but you won't stay there. I was like, okay. And he was right. I didn't. I went in and out of remission for about nine months. And at the end of nine months, I just consistently got better. And then they called it spontaneous regression of disease. And then one day they took blood after 14 months and said, we really can't find any leukemic cells. We don't know what you're doing, but have a nice life, basically. Wow. So I had done all this, you know, with food and I was, I was cooking at home, but I didn't really understand. I, I didn't understand it. I was just doing what this book I had said to eat. So I decided. I decided to study everything I could find about macrobiotics and nutrition and Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. And I, I now teach a sort of a blend of all of that. I got my master's in food science and nutrition so I could understand it and be able to speak from a Western science standpoint. And when I look at Chinese medicine and, and, and science, they just overlap each other almost perfectly. So ancient wisdom really serves us in modern times if we pay attention. That was the really short story. <laughs> no, no. I, I feel like, you know, like I said, I I had read it, and but I felt like the viewers needed to know. And so uh, you do have a question from one of my loyal viewers, oh, Atisha. Okay. Can you see that on the screen? I, I actually can't. I mean, okay. I have glasses I'll read it. on, but it's really tiny. <laughs> it's okay. I'll read it. Now you're on your phone. Okay. What is the yeah. hardest thing to let go in terms of sugar? Sugar. Sugar and actually, uh, sugar. Yeah. Really? Okay. I mean, I, you, I drank espresso every day. I still have one a couple of times a week, but I have to tell you the biggest, the hardest thing was sugar. It wasn't cheese. It wasn't milk. I didn't care about any of that. If somebody said, give it up. Great. When I was a child, they used to pay me to drink milk. They'd go, like, here's a quarter, please drink your milk. And I'd be like, it's disgusting. And my father being a butcher would bring home all this, I guess, great meat. And he said the worst thing in his life was watching me eat meat. I would cut it up and cut it up and cut it up and put ketchup on it, no matter what it was. And then they'd find it in a napkin on the floor under the table because I didn't want to eat it. I used to spit it out into a napkin. So he said, you don't have the DNA to eat meat. And I was like, okay. So, um, so yeah, so sugar. sugar. Letizia sugar was the pit to give up. Sugar was brutal. Sugar was brutal. I was a pastry chef. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Now, Edwin has a yeah. question. He's another very loyal viewer. Sugar isn't everything. I could live on a Pepsi or sweet tea on IV. How do you get off sugar? And do you approve of stevia or agave? Uh, I like stevia. Stevia is actually a very nice, no calorie sweetener. You just have to get used to the taste because it's so sweet that you think uh, this can't be good. And if you don't use it properly, it has kind of a metallic aftertaste, right? But, uh, other, but stevia is okay. Agave... Uh, is a is a new altern not new but it's an alternative sweetener that I'm not wild about because when they when they process agave the first process is not sweet agave is tequila and tequila is a lot of things most of them fun but it's not <laughs> sweet right so uh, so they process it a lot to drive up the fructose and when they drive up the fructose 
it disrupts the way the liver metabolizes other nutrients. So I'm not a fan of agave. I use brown rice syrup and coconut sugar, both of which are low glycemic index and are sweet. Um, so yeah, I hear them about sugar. I mean, I would put chocolate in an IV if we could, you know, so I, I hear them and it's really hard. It takes, I'm not, uh, I like structure. So I'm really not the person to say, oh, just gradually wean off sugar. Because if somebody told me that 35 years ago, I'd still be weaning. There'd still be a bag of frozen Snicker bars in the freezer, you know, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, I eat less. You really have to, uh, it's harsh. And I'll tell you, it's not easy. I, I had to cold turkey it. One day sugar, the next day gone. And I mean everything. I didn't eat fruit, not a hard candy, not a piece of gum, nothing. And it took about a month. And, and for the first two weeks, I was pretty cranky. So if you're, if you're a person that has discipline, you can gradually wean off. Like if you drink sweet tea or soda every day, go down to every other day and then go down to twice a week. And then, but I'm not that, I'm not that person. I'm kind of a, an all or nothing. You know what, what I mean? I, I'm, I, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not a wiener. I can't do it. I was going to ask you, what's your take on raw honey? Uh, you know, honey is, I'm kind of of two minds. Uh, most vegans don't eat honey because it is an animal product. I'm not that kind of vegan. I mean, I'm a vegan, but <laughs> please. Um, sorry if I offended any vegans because um, I am one. But um, honey, honey is kind of an interesting sweetener because on one hand, it's a simple sugar. So it digests and you get that sugar rush right away. But honey is also what's called an inverted sugar. So while you might feel a little bit of a rush, it still breaks down slowly in the body. So it kind of lasts for a while when you have it. And raw honey, honey in general, especially raw honey, has so many nutrients and antioxidants. And in Mediterranean eating, they often use honey when people are iron anemic, iron deficient anemia, because it's so high in iron. So I'm kind of, it's, it's calorically dense. It's a simple sugar, but there's so much nutrients in honey that, I can't really say don't do it. I mean, I'd say don't do agave before I'd say don't do honey. Okay. Was, I just got an education because I, I don't use agave, but I hear about it a lot, especially, you know, if I'm going to a chef demo and, you know, they're doing a the smoothie and I'm like, oh, if the fruit is not quite ripe and it's not sweet enough and you want to keep it healthy, just add a little agave to it. So uh, Edwin, right. answer that question because I, I hadn't well, used people it. Like, I'm a raw honey People, girl. Yeah, people like agave because it has a very sort of... Um, what, What's the, what's the, like a, like a flat taste. It's sweet, but it's not really like rice syrup tastes like butterscotch, coconut sugar tastes like brown sugar. So agave is kind of like a blank slate of sweetener. The problem is the level of fructose in it. Okay. Now you are a uh, whole foods, a uh, healthy foods advocate. And I know particularly when people think about buying organic or buying whole foods, not to be necessarily confused with a store of the same title, right. whole foods, they think of, you know, right. their grocery bills going up. How do you, what advice would you give people who are looking, even if it's not like a clean, complete slate, cold turkey, like you did to yeah. really incorporate more yeah. whole foods and more organic foods into their diet? Well, I actually don't recommend people do what I did because, I mean, we, we live in a world now where there's, we have everything. The good news is we can get anything anytime. And the bad news is we can get anything anytime. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I think that if people go home, like they watch this tonight, they're so inspired. They open their cabinets, they take it all to a homeless shelter. In two weeks, they're going to go, that Angela Ray, she had that <laughs> whack job on there. So, <laughs> you know, I tell people to do two things at the same time. One, eat more vegetables. I don't care how. It could be a salad, it could be uh, steamed greens, it could be sauteed greens, it could be broccoli. I don't care how, but add more vegetables to your diet. They have high fiber, they're gonna help your digestion, they're gonna give you everything you need in nutrition from protein to minerals. The other thing I have them do like in a parallel sort of path is I tell people to take one unhealthy ingredient out of your pantry each week and replace it with a healthy version of it. If it's white sugar, take it out and replace it with coconut sugar. It's a one-to-one -one sub, it's a low glycemic index. In six months, you have a new pantry and a new way of eating. And you've done it gradually, painless. Nobody said, oh God, don't invite Angela to dinner anymore. All she does, <laughs> right? You don't, you don't go through that. Yeah, and it's, and it's painless, it really is. But it, and the big thing for Americans is getting more vegetables into their diet. 
right? The, the bad news is only 19% of Americans eat vegetables more than once a day. And the bad news about that is 80% of that 19% eats, it, eats their veggies as french fries. It, it, it's not good. <laughs> oh man, it's not good yeah. at all. And I, wow. We need to eat our veggies. That's all. We just need to eat our veggies. It's really, yeah. you know, your mother was right, at least about that one. Right. Oh my goodness. That is sobering. Yeah. And I, as I'm thinking, what did I eat today? Well, I, I was somewhat good because I knew that I was going to be talking to you today. So I wanted to feel really good about this conversation. So like <laughs> yesterday I grilled some uh, veggie kebabs. I had squash and zucchini, yeah. onion, uh, cherry tomato. And, and I'm yeah. going to be honest, I did stick like a real little small piece of sausage one on each kebab. But yeah, <laughs> I felt really good yeah. about those vegetables. And, and look, you know, I, I mean, I, I can honestly tell you that there is no good news about animal food, the way we consume it in the United States. But I also think, I also know actually for a fact that it's such a big part of our culture that I think people have to gradually kind of eat less of it. If you don't want to do it for your own health, you have to do it for the planet. The latest statistics tell us that if every man, woman, and child in America ate one meatless meal a week out of their 21 meals, that's one, it's the equivalent of taking four to six million cars off the road. That's how polluting it is to factory farm. And I won't, I won't go into the whole vegan cruelty thing of factory farming because that's karma and you know whatever God thinks about that. But just if you want to have a planet for your children and your children's children, we have to eat less meat and figure out a way to process it that's not quite so toxic to the animal and to... Um, the planet. I mean, the planet, think about the, the, the one thing that's really good about the pandemic is if you look up, just look up the canals of Venice on a Google search and you'll find I the canals that. are, yes. right? there haven't been swans in the canals of Venice in decades because of pollution, but two months without cruise ships, pure. India hasn't seen blue skies. They're seeing blue skies since March. Philadelphia, where I am, the air is 60% improved air quality. So there's no smog in California. And I'm not saying we're going to live in our homes forever and not, you know, go out and do things. But what I, what I hope deep down to my soul is that we come out of the pandemic a little more compassionate, A, for each other, and B, that we take a little more stewardship of this planet when we see how quickly Mother Nature recovered without us. Like I always say, it's like mother nature said to us, now go to your rooms and think about what you've done. So we're all in quarantine thinking about what we've done. So I'm hoping we don't jump out and start acting like maniacs again and that we like pay attention. We do more cooking at home. We take better care of ourselves and our, our communities and our planet. We treat each other equally. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that I hope change and uh, you know, the planet, the, the health of the planet is just one of them. And uh, we have a long way to go, but I think that the pandemic has shown us, number one, the difference between need and want. Oh, and yeah. number two, it's shown us how much we need each other. The thing you hear the most and the thing that I will absolutely concur with is I miss my people. I love my husband, we get along great. It's, it's, you know, it's great where we don't fight but I miss my people. I miss hugging my girlfriends, kissing them on both cheeks, meeting for a coffee. I will never, when we're allowed, I will never again tell somebody I'm too busy to meet them for coffee ever. So I think that the pandemic has shown us that we can't, we can't do without each other. Not any of us, not, I don't care what color you are, what orientation you are, you cannot do without the rest of us. What happens to one of us happens to all of us. And the George Floyd controversy, showed us that more than anything. And it's not because this police officer was caught on video. It's not because, but as, as a species, humanity watched some, some, a human take another human's life. And we said, you know what? We're, we're not doing this anymore. We're not doing this anymore. I don't care who you were. There's not one person who said good for him. Do you know what I mean? So I think and the pandemic has amplified how much we need each other. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. Edwin has another question for you. That question is, okay. given education of food science, what do you think people need to know about the mass production? 
of food? Well, Edwin, there's no good news about mass production of food. Um, the, the more food is processed, just to give you like a little, the more the food is processed, the more hands that touch it, um, the more money somebody's making on that food and the less healthy it is for you. So flour grows, we grind it and it should be okay. That should be it. Right. But it's not, we strip it of nutrients. We re-enrich it. We add flavor. We do this. And every time it passes through somebody's hands on its way to your table, somebody else is making more money and your health is being compromised. So when you look at a label, if you're reading labels, when you're in the store, if it reads like a Russian novel, you know, there's a, an ingredient panel this long, <laughs> you got to find something else. You know, if you're buying an apple pie and the last ingredient is apples, you probably could find something less processed. It's the less processing, the better. Your label should be small, not a lot of stuff in it. Your food should be as close to mother nature as it can get. And, you know, for wellness. Now you have written eight cookbooks, uh, mm -hmm. your latest back to the cutting board. What yep. separates this cookbook from your previous books? Um, well, they all kind of, they all, all my cookbooks built on the very first one, which is called cooking the whole foods way. And, um, that book, that book has 500 recipes and it was kind of like, uh, this iconic, it has become this iconic book. It was named Healthiest Cookbook of the Decade. It was all about macrobiotics. It had all this like, interesting ingredients in it. And as I progressed in my career working, I realized that many, many people are very intimidated by unfamiliar ingredients. And um, this book is a new publisher for me. And they allowed me to have beautiful full color photography, which is the first time I've had it. So people can look at something and know what the dish is supposed to look like when they're done. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really simple. There's not a recipe that takes more than a page. And, you know, it's very um, sort of reasonable things and familiar things for people to uh, cook. And I also show them how to sub ingredients for healthier ones. So, yeah. Okay. And so how have you, I, I know that uh, you grew up cooking Italian. Have you been able to make that healthy for yourself now? Because I was watching one of your Instagram lives where you were making a pesto. Uh, and you were talking yeah. about the pine nuts. <laughs> but when I think of, I don't know, maybe I just don't know how to make pesto. But when I've made it a few times, I, I haven't made it exactly healthy, but I probably haven't made it vegan as well. Right. So uh, Italian food is really easy to make healthy because it's, it's pretty healthy in the first place. Um, like Italian American food is very different than Italian food. Uh, oh. Italian food in America is loaded with cheese. We take our pizzas, we stuff cheese into the pie crust. We put seven kinds of meat. We serve it with cinnamon buns or whatever the heck we're doing now. Um, in Italy, a pizza is, you know, you can eat it by yourself. It, uh, they don't do big giant pizzas. It's a little pizza. It's a thin crust. It's got some tomato sauce, a couple of like little blurbs of, of mozzarella if you want it. But they're very, they're more, much more simple. Um, dairy food, which is so associated with Italian cooking, is really just like a condiment when you eat real Italian food. It's lighter, it's fresher, it's more seasonal. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. We, we took a group to uh, Tuscany. One, it was sort of the end of spring into summer. And we had a group that was really committed to eating dark leafy greens. So first thing I did when I get there a week before the group, I go to the supermarket and there's all these beautiful greens. A week later, my group arrives. I walk into the grocery store and I say to the produce guy, there's no greens. Where are the greens? And he said, we don't have them. And I said, well, when will you get them in again? He said, next April. So they eat very seasonally there. He said, no, no, no. Now's the time for lettuce. And I'm like, he's right. So you can't get tomatoes, you know, nine days a week, cherry when, and, and they always have something to look forward to. Oh my goodness. It's cherry season. Mushrooms are in, it's cauliflower time. <laughs> so they're they're and they're very committed to food and the act of eating that you take, take your time, you sit down and you eat. They don't eat in their cars. They don't eat walking that, you know, like mealtime is still quite sacred in a lot of countries in Europe, but Italy is the one where I'm most familiar. So making Italian food that's healthy is completely easy. I mean, we bake our own bread anyway in our house. So we make our own pizza dough and it's just easy, but you can get a vegan pizza or a healthy pizza anywhere in, in, in Philadelphia. It's easy. So easy to be, it's so easy now to be vegan. It is. I a mean, people easier. want what I, they I want, right? Yeah, a lot easier, a lot easier. Yeah. 
your show, Christina Cooks, is back on PBS. You've taken a hiatus. Mm -hmm. What can be, I know you're it in is. the midst of as well. What, um, what can people expect this time around? Um, well, this time around, I'm in a new setting, which is the culinary school where I teach. It looks like a, a, a European courtyard, though. It's actually a very dramatic set. And okay. uh, what people can expect this time is, I'm trying to think of how delicate way to say this. I've always been sort of very uh, shy about like hard facts. This show is a little more in your face. This show is, this show is a little more wake up and smell the toast, people. We have to eat better. And I'm, it's still funny and I'm not mean. But it's a little more of here's the reality of what we face. You know, 88% of us, 88% of us are not metabolically fit to fight off infection. That's a scary thing, especially living in a pandemic. You know, when we yeah. have all these lifestyle diseases, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, stroke, even cancer, and we give it this fuzzy name, lifestyle disease. Oh my God, that sounds so comforting but it means it's caused by your lifestyle. You change your lifestyle, you reduce your risk. Is there a guarantee? No, I mean, no, but, but it, you got a better shot at getting out of this thing alive. Yeah. So that shows a little I, more uh, hard hitting, I guess. Okay. In, in, you have my, a in my, we did, we did. We had it in, uh, in, in January when the show hit and these shows will actually start in either November or January. So we'll probably have another one. So, okay. We like we like to have parties, okay. so we're good. <laughs> and I have the greatest now, crew that ever existed, ever. I love my crew. When I think of whole foods, there are lots of things that come to mind. Obviously, you know, veggies and whole grains, uh, brown rice. But I don't tend to think of cookies, and yet you have a cookie line. Tell us a little bit about I your do. cookie line. <laughs> I do. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a former pastry chef. So um, when, when I gave up, you know, when I got my, over my addiction to sugar and I wanted to start making desserts again, because the thought for me, the thought of living without dessert is like, that would just be a grim endurance of life. Why, why would I want to do that? So, and I kind of have always lived, my family's Italian. I've kind of always lived sort of by the European rule, which is three bites. You eat a small dessert, three bites, after three bites, your body doesn't taste sugar anymore. So if you go to Europe, you notice that the desserts are these little slivers or these little tiny cookies or these little, because after three bites, you don't taste sugar. So they don't limit themselves. They're like, well, I'm going to have an espresso and a cookie or two, and it's not going to land on my hips and turn me into, you know, the Titanic. So, so uh, the cookie bakery online started as a vanity project because I love to bake, but of course, I don't want them around the house all the time because I mean, there's always some cookies in my kitchen, but I don't want millions of cookies because I'm always baking. So I'm like, Hey, let me start this online bakery. And, um, the pandemic took me from having a little, you know, vanity project to about a hundred to 120 dozen a week since March. So this particular wow. week, uh, I, yeah, I know I, but I love it. So it's good. This particular week, the bakery is closed because we start shooting on the weekend and I wanted to not be exhausted. So it starts up again after we uh, are done this weekend. So like July 1st, the bakery will reopen. So, so that's what the cookies are about. And they're all made with um, sprouted whole wheat flour and sprouted flour digests in the body like a vegetable, not a carbohydrate because they sprout the wheat and they dry the sprout and that becomes the flour. They're very light. I use coconut sugar and brown rice syrup, organic vanilla, uh, nuts, every, fair trade chocolate. Um, everything we use is the best quality that we can get. And we mail them all over the country to people. Ooh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I don't know about anybody else, but I want one right now. Like, especially <laughs> with all of that description of the ingredients, I'm like, ooh, why do I want a cookie? Like, right this minute. <laughs> Yeah, that's the problem in our house. We always want the cookies. Uh, yeah. So. Edwin has another question for you. Okay. What is your opinion of the new trend of vegan wines? Um, you know, vegan wines is a, is a thing that's been around for quite some time. And it's a little bit of, uh, 
it doesn't really apply so much anymore. It used to be back in like back in the day, they very often used to filter wine through like uh, ground up bones of animals. I, I don't know what it proved, but that's what they did. And hardly anyone does that anymore. So most wines are vegan, but there are companies that feel like, feel like they really have to say that. I don't think they're, I have not come across, at least in Italy, any company that has any practice that uses animals animal food anymore but they you know they are there so if you're looking wine you might want to check it out and make sure it is vegan but uh if that's important to you so um but most you know most wines don't actually have that practice anymore you got another question from yolanda also known mm -hmm. as nina simone she's played that role and will be on tour around the country very soon any tips Love on nina best simone. dessert recipes with almond flour that is not an almond cookie um you mean just solely almond flour on its own or almond flour mixed with another flour? Because on its own, almond flour can be heavy. There are people that use it. And I guess if you use eggs in your baking, you'd probably be okay. I mean, in vegan baking, almond flour on its own results in something that's kind of rather dense. I know there are several cakes that I make, a carrot almond cake um, and a maple cake that I use, like two thirds of the sprouted flour and one third almond flour. And the almond flour mm -hmm. gives you like a nice moist crumb since I don't use eggs or butter. So um, I use it that way. 100% almond flour. I tried to make a brownie 100% almond flour and they just crumbled too much because I don't use eggs. If you use eggs, you probably have a better shot. Okay. Now you have a, uh, a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, your goal is to help people change their relationships with food. How can people get involved with that? and or support it? Um, you can go to my website will christinacooks.com can take you to the link to the website. We do everything from programs in schools to uh, use the money to support the TV show because that gives us a, a big classroom. I mean, I'm at the end of the day, I'm a teacher. So, you know, the bigger the classroom, the more the information gets out there and people can go to the website and find out how they can help. Um, because that helps to keep the show consistently on the air and also helps us to finance programs in schools because going into it, and it's hard to go into schools now because of, you know, mass shootings and no one's strangers wanted in schools. But when you do go in, schools are on such tight budgets that we can't have a program going in there that costs them money. So we are able to donate everything that we do. And what we have a six part program called Grow Up Healthy. And um, we go in and we do everything from have the kids work with a florist and carve little flowers out of fruit while they're eating it. We have a magician who comes in and turns unhealthy food into healthy food. We have a vegetable carver who comes in and, you know, turns a melon into a parrot. And then we have cooking classes. We bring in a, a vegan chocolate fountain for the, the last class for the kids to dip their fruit in. It's a lot of fun. We work very hard to keep the kids engaged and it's for really young kids for like first to fourth grade. And we've done it in uh, several schools down here in South Philly, underserved schools. And it's just, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. And to see the kids is like wild. We, um, we had one kid in, in one group that we did. This kid was, I had to pay him to taste everything. I was always giving this kid a dollar. <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm not, e I'm not eating this, Chef Christine. I'm like, okay, I'll give you a dollar. Okay. And he would eat it. So the, the program ends, school ends for the year. And I'm in the farmer's market here. And I hear my name being called by a kid and I turn around and it's this kid. I'm like, what are you doing in the farmer's market? And his mother said, oh yeah, thank you, Chef Christina. We have to come to the farmer's market every week to try a new vegetable. And I looked at him and I'm like, wait, what? And he goes, yeah, come with me. And we go to this big display of vegetables and he goes, tried that one, really good. That one, I don't care what you tell me, it's disgusting. And he went down the whole table of veggies and I said, you tried all of these. And he said, well, that's what you said. And I thought, <laughs> my life is complete. I can die happy. This child tried veggies. And I think, you know, for parents, it's, it's difficult because um, kids are so marketed to, you know, honey, oh, yeah. what do you want for lunch? Tofu and Brussels sprouts or the happy meal with the superhero toy. You know what I mean? It's like, eh. but I think if parents um, set the example and, you know, cook in a way that they're not sort of like the food police do the best you can and the kids will try it if you don't make a big deal. 
And then eventually, you know, you change. Yeah. You know, and the foundation you lay at home is the foundation they come back to. Yeah. Has so, been my experience. A follow up to Yolanda's question about the using the almond flour dessert was she was talking about yeah. making those cook with no eggs. So I guess she's not using eggs. Um, then you're not going to be able to use straight almond flour, Yolanda. You're going to have to uh, mix it in with another flour, either whole wheat pastry or whole wheat sprouted. Um, something that is going to you need something to hold it together. So it's either the gluten from flour or it's eggs. You can try arrowroot, which can work as a vegan egg, but it's, it's spotty at best. So I usually mix almond flour. The most I've done is half and half, and you get a nice result. And you said arrowroot. Is that what people also use in all natural deodorants? Or am I getting that mixed up? Uh, you're thinking baking soda, I think. Okay. Arrowroot is like cornstarch, but a little less refined. And you can use it to create an egg, like, like a binder in, in a cake that, needs, that uses eggs. Okay. All right. Well, as we get ready to wrap up our time together tonight, do you have any advice you might offer for someone who's interested in becoming a chef? Uh, yeah. First of all, cook every chance you get. Um, you know, I mean, for me, I, I did not go to formal culinary school training. I trained on the job. And um, if, you can, if you're able to do that, you know, it's hard. Everything with restaurants is hard now, but I would say get yourself to culinary school. There's everything from two year to four year programs in Philadelphia. Of course, we have the school where I teach is called uh, the restaurant school at Walnut Hill College. And we really do a lot to train chefs. You can take community ed classes. Um, the most important thing you can do is cook and make sure that you love it. Right. So people always think, oh, my God, I'm going to be a chef and I'm going to become famous. The chances of you becoming famous are probably slim to none. I mean, everybody has a shot, right? But mostly you're going to work in a hot, sweaty kitchen, be underpaid and overworked. So if you don't love every garlic clove that you chop on your cutting board, you might want to rethink chef and just cook for your family. You know, chef is a very, um, it's the greatest job in the world. I, I won't lie, but it's, you have to really love it. You have to adore it. You're never going to have a holiday or a birthday or a Christmas Eve off. Yeah. But, but if you love it, you're the restaurant people where you work become your family. Like they're your family. You celebrate with them and yes, your family too, but you know, it, a good restaurant, a great restaurant, the staff is like family and you know, you get along great. I've always had great experiences in the business. I'll never tell anyone not to do it. It's a great business. It's challenging now um, because we don't know what it's going to look like after the pandemic, people eating out, you know, it's, do people even want to eat out? It's a big, um, we're in a big shift. So, and eating out's fine as long as you still cook at home. I definitely believe that. And I echo that. Well, Christina, thank you so much for hanging out thank with you. us tonight on the Angela Ray Show. Uh, you have been a wealth of information. Uh, looking <laughs> forward to connecting with you on some of your social media platforms so that I can follow uh, some of the advice that you offer and your cooking demos and all of that great stuff. Um, great. Yeah. So you, will you have any upcoming classes, uh, either online or any of your shows that specifically speak to, uh, um, not just necessarily eating generally getting better, you know, just replacing the, you know, the one ingredient a month in your pantry, but someone who may be experiencing illness in their bodies, whether that's cancer or diabetes, yeah. like, you know, that path that they can go down. Well, we hope, we hope if everything goes well, that we start our in-person demo classes in September. And that schedule is already on christinacooks.com. And every, every class has a theme, but every class goes exactly where the audience wants it to go. I'm cooking what I'm cooking, and I'm hoping I'm talking about heart disease. But if the class wants to talk about something else, we talk about something else. And so people ask questions through the whole thing. I don't inhibit people. I don't say, no, 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 no questions till the end. It's sort of like a giant party, our classes, because people are always asking questions, they're laughing, it, it's, they're great. So I, and we are gonna be doing some online things, which will be fun, um, but it makes me sad because I really wanna, I, I like my in-person, I miss my, I miss looking out at smiling faces and you know what I mean? Well, you know, yeah, but. I definitely yeah. know. <laughs> 
I'm telling you. So, I, you know, I want to get back to real live classes, but we are going to do some online stuff and everything will end up on the website at some point. But the, the ones we're doing in person, we hope from September to December are already on the website. We do hands on and demo classes. And are those only in the Philadelphia area or do you travel around the country? Uh, I, mostly in Philadelphia now. I, I do travel around the country right now. We're trying to, uh, you know, get back into that again. But um, until everything is settled, right now everything's in Philadelphia. Okay. I mean, I teach around the world as, it, as you know, as a regular part of my job. But, yeah, it's, this has been weird. <laughs> Hasn't it? It's oh, um, my Lord. different. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a very kind word for a different. Yeah. Different. You know, there's well, an ancient I, Chinese curse in Chinese medicine and the curse is may you live in interesting times. And here we are. Oh, uh, okay. It's actually okay. a curse. <laughs> so, <laughs> if somebody, if somebody in ancient China said, may you live in interesting times, that's it. You were dead to them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I will keep that in mind if I ever hear that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If you ever hear that, run. Well, Christina, again, thank you so much for hanging out with thank us you so tonight. Much. And uh, enjoy Thanks for your patience your earlier. You too. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a good night. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All, right. All right. That is it for the Angela Ray Show for this Wednesday edition. As always, I would like to remind you of Ray of Motivation number 54. Cleaning a mirror will not change the person who is reflected in it. Until next time, I encourage you to go out and be the change. Have a great evening.